And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Team County uh, Sustainability <laughs> and Conservation. Thank you, Doug. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're here, as the title says, to talk about the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. And I have a question for you. How many of you have heard about it? OK, about 2 thirds. And how many were actively involved in it? Ah, yes. <laughs> thank you well, very thank much. You. <laughs> so some of this will be uh, the first time some of you are hearing about this plan, and others of you will be very intimately aware of it. What we thought we'd like to do is Julia and I are going to be uh, trading off on the presentation, and so we each will have uh, sections to present to you. Um, we're going to give you an overview of how the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan started, what was its genesis, um, how we interacted with the community. Um, Pima County, of course, represents uh, the greatest jurisdiction in terms of size and uh, authority. Um, what each of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan elements are. As you know, um, it wasn't only about habitat conservation. It wasn't only about archaeology and historic preservation. There were a range of conservation values that were brought forward. We'll also talk about the, the accomplishments over the last 10 years. Um, a lot of people think the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan is over. Well, it's not. It's a living. Uh, breathing, evolving uh, plan, and there are, have been actions that we've all taken to actually uh, ensure its uh, implementation. We'll talk about um, how we set priorities through science. We'll talk about the 2004 bond election and how the voters uh, facilitated actual implementation. We'll talk about the multi-species conservation plan, which is also a, a very important um, new permit that the county will obtain uh, as a consequence of this planning. And then we'll talk about the future of our conservation lands management program. Um, so with that, um, I did want to just uh, comment on the handouts that we've provided. Um, one is, uh, these were the element. Uh, we had little brochures like this for each of the elements. Since this is an archaeology and historic preservation crowd, conservation crowd, we brought this one on the historic preservation element, and it's still very relevant today. We also brought you a list of the 2004 bond projects, um, preservation bond projects that uh, voters approved. And then Julia also handed out our uh, brochure on the multi-species conservation plan. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Julia <laughs> Fonseca, who's an environmental planning manager, and she's heading up the conservation science aspect of our um, program. Julia. OK, well, thank you. Um, I'm not a cultural resource scientist. I come to you from the world of hydrology and geology. And I was pulled into the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan when the pygmy owl was uh, listed um, shortly thereafter. So. The pygmy owl was listed as an endangered species, and this brought to a head a lot of long-standing community conflict about where and how we should grow. Um, if you've been in Tucson for a good period of time, you might remember Rancho Romero. Does anybody remember that back in 74? Probably some of you people worked on that issue. Um, this was a big land use conflict over uh, development next to the Catalina Mountains. That continued into the 80s with every major rezoning. Sabino Springs, Rincon Valley, Vale Valley, many, many different conflicts. Uh, so when the pygmy owl was listed as an endangered species, uh, it, it, it brought um, to the attention of developers in Pima County the nexus between a healthy environment and the economic well-being of this town. And it brought to the Board of Supervisors the need to deal with some of these long-standing issues in a much more comprehensive way than the community has ever had to deal with it. And so I think it was clear from the outset, the Board made clear, the Board at that time made clear, that um, something big was going to happen. And it was going to affect land use. It was going to affect development. And that brought a lot of people to the table. There was also concern on the part of the ranching community that the solution to the pygmy owl would affect their way of life. 
there was concerns on the part of the environmental community and biologists about how Pima County would negotiate this, this conflict and this, the outcomes for species, not just the endangered species, but also wildlife as a whole. You know, there's a big, big sentiment in this community uh, for protection of the Sonoran Desert and for the wildlife. And then, of course, for the cultural resource values and the, the sense of place, what would this mean? And the board started making decisions right off the bat that included things like uh, not building a major community center, uh, uh, the, the Pima Community College, on pygmy owl habitat. So that got people's attention about how, how to deal with these issues. One of the first things uh, then that occurred was that Pima County entered into agreements with every land managing agency to create the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan at the federal, the state, and the local levels. And so this took a lot of work, took a, transpired over a couple of years. Um, and then really started uh, working on a committee structure, how to bring the community involved, how to, how to get public involvement. So, um, okay. yeah, that'd be a good yeah, that's a good segue. <laughs> so once the, the uh, federal agencies and state agencies as well as the Tahana Otham Nation um, basically uh, agreed to be partners with Pima County going forward, uh, we engaged the community. And by doing that, um, Julia raised a good question. How did, how, what was our plan to negotiate an agreement, really, with all the stakeholders? And you just heard about what all the um, conflicting values are, what all the conflicting uh, needs are. And so we cr created a steering committee. Um, it was open to every kind of stakeholder and virtually everyone who wanted to participate. And um, they just needed to commit uh, their time and their willingness to work and participate to become members. So we ended up with 85 uh, people on a steering committee that, uh, again, represented every one of the stakeholders from environmentalists, ranchers, developers, uh, the agencies themselves, special interest groups, uh, Saba, you, can, you name it. Um, uh, the, the, the realtors were very uh, concerned about uh, what kinds of regulations might come down as were uh, the environmental community saying, you're not going to control this enough. And the, that same growth, anti-growth war was at the basis of it. And so the mission uh, is really to strike that balance between growth and conservation. Where should conservation occur and where should growth occur because growth is inevitable. It is going to happen. People are going to continue to move here despite the economic downturn right now. We're not in that sort of frenzied period anymore, but that tension will always exist. And so it, it became our charge with the steering committee to go forward and try to um, literally identify what was important in the community and um, what were the best methods to get there. So with this steering committee, we held uh, what we call boot camp out at the Arizona Sonoran <coughs> Desert Museum. Every month, all day on a, one Saturday a month, there would be a sort of an educational se session uh, representing a certain stakeholder interest or perspective or a set of information that needed to be considered. And so that everyone had the same basis on which to go forward in a decision-making process. Um, with that, at the same time, uh, we identified um, technical committees that were uh, there to advise the steering committee and staff and others on uh, what were the best ways to conserve or uh, allow certain kinds of development uh, regarding certain elements. And I'll have Julia talk about the various uh, elements uh, for the uh, Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. And I see, um, let, why don't you start with habitat since that's sure. really the okay, so, genesis. Uh, yeah, one, one of the, the elements obviously had to be how are we going to address the, the critical habitat of the pygmy owl, but as well as other species. So. Uh, in order to do that, we really had kind of a, a, a two-layer thing. We had a science technical advisory team, even though, and there was some bristling of other disciplinarians uh, by calling the biologists the scientists and not some of the other scientists <laughs> who were engaged in the process. Uh, but that's what we call them, the science team. Uh, and they were charged with coming up with a, um, a reserve design that would fit the needs not only for the pygmy owl, 
but many other species that might be listed as federally endangered or threatened in the future because we don't want to just solve the problem for one species and then have another uh, endangered species be, become listed and then have to go through the whole process again. Um, the other um, kind of charge really was the broader one that I mentioned about wildlife. You know, how are wildlife going to move through the landscape? How are we going to achieve this, this kind of permeable landscape that keeps the common species common? Uh, we don't want to see them uh, disappearing either. Uh, and then uh, we also had another element that, that addressed riparian areas in particular. And that was not only uh, because of the importance of riparian areas for, for species, but also because of the importance of riparian areas for water quality protection and our groundwater is largely recharged along uh, certain streams and, and it's not recharged in, term, in the uplands so much. So we really need to protect riparian areas and how are we going to achieve that? So um, these, these three elements really were, were tackled by uh, a science team and I can tell you um, they were very reluctant uh, to, to, um, to venture in this. These were largely um, academ academic uh, specialists in uh, a variety of uh, bio biological uh, fields and uh, some agency representatives as well. And uh, they were always wondering about the political side. But they were told, you know, tell, just tell us the right answer from the perspective of your science and let us figure out what we can achieve politically. And so that even though they were nervous about having public meetings, though every, every technical committee meeting was public, so anybody could sit in, but not ever, anybody could speak. It was just for the, um, the science technical team or the other technical teams to, to speak. Um, but, but that way, everybody in the rest of the community who were keenly interested in, in what was transpiring, you know, at the, uh, behind, not behind doors, um, <laughs> but with the biology team, everybody wanted to know. So at first, you know, there were lots of people attending these meetings, and as they heard, heard the boring discussions, a lot of them uh, started to melt away. Um, but, they, but we had minutes and we had an open door policy uh, as though these were uh, under the Arizona open meeting law. We adhered to them in, even though they weren't officially board commissioned committees. So that kind of uh, got the process rolling. And um, the, I think the, the, the engagement to them was give us your best science. And, and we have people coming out of the woodwork after a while, after they realized that this was something something was going to happen, something big, they wanted to be part of it. And we had people who had 30 years of knowledge about, you know, fish species or talus snails or uh, the distribution of a, of a rare plant coming forward and volunteering that information. So uh, a lot of uh, what we got here was local knowledge that could not have been, you could not have consulted for this knowledge. You, there's no money in the world that could have gotten that information uh, to come forward to the process. And it was a real credit to uh, not only the biologists, but the other participating uh, scientists and, and amateurs, true amateurs who had a lot to contribute from this community. We have a highly knowledgeable and educated mm -hmm. group of people here. We do. And then in, in addition to the um, science technical advisory team, we had two other technical advisory teams, um, the ranch technical advisory team, and the cultural resources and historic preservation team. Um, these teams were essentially uh, formed, again, of people who are experts in their field. In the ranch technical advisory team, uh, we had clearly ranchers who know their business very well. Uh, we had uh, people who represent ranchers um, and their interests. and. Um, we had also agency people and academicians from the university who were uh, also in the School of Agriculture and had uh, a d different kind of picture. And the ranchers' concern largely was, you know, how will these endangered species listings and the regulations, because it was assumed that would be the, uh, the heavy hammer, how will it affect my economic livelihood? How will it affect how I do business? Are you putting me out of business? Um, on the cultural resources side, uh, again, these were, this was a team of experts uh, from the university, uh, experts in the community, people who have done research uh, in specific areas. And we invited them, uh, again, to uh, discuss um, 
both from known site locations as well as predictive modeling, uh, where are those best places to conserve? And I'll just give you a little bit of background. This, this uh, map, and you're welcome to come up to it later. I realize you can't all see it. This is eastern Pima County. It's about the size of two Rhode Islands. And this is the Tahana Autumn Reservation in the Santa Verde District, and the white is the, the urban and suburban area. Um, all the green are our ranches, okay? All that green is ranch land. And the, it clearly became evident as, as a consequence of researching where is ranching on the landscape? that ranching is the single greatest determinant of defining an urban boundary. As ranches fail or are sold for development, that's how our urban sprawl occurs. That's how we lose habitat. That's how we lose cultural landscapes. So with this land use um, that really had never been investigated by Pima County or quantified or mapped, it, evident, it became abundantly clear that if we're going to be preserving habitat, biological values, uh, riparian areas, as well as cultural resources and cultural landscapes of importance, keeping these ranch lands intact was a very critical uh, part of the equation. And keeping those ranchers either um, viable or buying development rights or buying ranches and letting the, land, the rancher continue to steward that land was part of the equation. On the cultural resources side, um, we tried to come up with, uh, and it's in your map, I don't have a, a board for you, but it's in that handout. We actually mapped um, known archeological and historic site locations, national register sites and districts, um, archeological site complexes where we know on the landscape there are clusters. So about 15% or so of eastern Pima County's actually been surveyed or inventoried for archeological and historic sites. So we're dealing with a very low number in terms of the land area uh, actually uh, inventoried. And, uh, but from those locations, we could then project uh, and also expert opinion and experience, you know, where are the most sensitive lands on the landscape? So using uh, a number of variables, we predicted in the sort of fuzzy brown areas, those areas um, of archeological sensitivity that were uh, probably of greatest value for conservation purposes. So at the end of the day, um, we find out that um, we really have uh, a lot of common ground, a lot of common interest and a, com a lot of commonality in what lands to preserve. And I'll let Julia take it from there. So uh, another thing that was going on at the same time as these cultural resource studies, biological studies, ranch tradition studies, uh, was, it, was, uh, was trying to answer the question about where our tax base comes from. And this is vitally important, obviously, for the Board of Supervisors. There's the stewards of the, of the Pima County tax base, and that's entirely related to the question of where growth occurs and how much is produced. And so one of the things that was key in, in bringing the different groups together was an understanding that the sewer service area, which su sewers support, increased densities. Um, and by doing so, they also uh, produce high tax base. And so the sewer service area is largely coincident with the, the area shown in white, the area that is not the ranch lands. The ranch lands are biologically important. The white lands that have the, the uh, sewer service area are economically important. And using uh, growth models, which we did, um, we found that, you know, we just don't need all of Pima County to support future growth. <laughs> so there, this, there's a lot of conflict that's, that's really unnecessary. And it was the understanding that came out of conversations and translations of, of every different uh, technical study into something that people could read, they could have it translated. Uh, there's an executive summary that puts it in, you know, more lay terms. There were presentations back to the community. And all, all of these reports, by the way, there's 200 of them, and they're still accessible to you through the internet at our website, which we'll go over later. But um, these were all really important in bringing everybody along at the same time. So we were all truly learning together.
these were all new discoveries to us mm -hmm. too, as, yeah. as Pima County planners. And exactly, so from, so the boot camp I mentioned for the steering committee uh, and that some of the technical advisory team members also attended these meetings it was basically the research done by them, by staff. Uh, Julia and I are veterans of that effort. And um, we authored, as did others, some of those 200 plus technical reports. Uh, there was a team of us working on the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. So out of that effort, um, we were educating the steering committee, we were educating the greater community, because those steering committee meetings are also open. And then um, ultimately the uh, dialogue started. And I just want to mention this one thing that, because people tend to be siloed, both physically, the urban core, and our, ur and our rural population, um, Socially, they don't intersect too often, and physically, they don't intersect too often. And so when we pulled all these stakeholders into the room together, there was literally some first-time dialogues between, you know, what are our rural values and wh how does that serve the greater community, and what are the, uh, what urban um, development means to you know, the, the well-being of the greater community. So that conversation was, uh, it was revealing because um, it was the first time many of this, many of them had actually heard out and listened and responded in a, in a, in a non-conflicted way about their respective values. So I think that was just a very um, uh, fruitful um, uh, community dialogue that was set up. So, so what are some of the, the accomplishments of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan? Well, right out of the gate, because so many people had come together uh, to talk about which landscapes were important to protect and which ones were not, um, that coincided with an interest in the federal land system to uh, designate a new monument. That was called Ironwood Forest National Monument, and it really was an outgrowth of the, the studies that had been done for the pygmy owl, uh, the studies that had been done for the, about the importance of the ironwood forest and some of the community dialogue about how do we, how are we going to resolve this issue of where we're going to grow. We, you know, we don't need to have every acre of BLM land to support future growth uh, in, in Pima County. And not only that, if we focus most of the urban growth where the infrastructure is, we're actually going to save money because we won't be extending expensive major infrastructure types very far away from what is already our service area. Another outgrowth of this was the designation of the La Cienegas uh, National Conservation Area. That is something that had been talked about for a long time, but now finally there was momentum to establish that. Another thing that uh, happened was uh, Secretary, then Secretary Babbitt said, you know, you, you've destroyed the Santa Cruz River. How's that ever gonna be fixed? Is that important biologically? And so City of Tucson and Pima County came together to create an allocation of effluent that would go to support future riparian projects. And we're just now constructing some of those projects along our major water courses where we're revegetating abandoned farmland to improve the condition of our riparian areas. Um, probably the most important thing is what we call the Mabin Behan conservation land system. And, and this is basically something that's been adopted into our comprehensive land use plan. And it says basically that we want to emphasize growth in the areas outside the conservation land system. And in the conservation land system, the shades of green and blue, uh, we want to protect as much as possible. But there are guidelines here that we use in the evaluation of new rezonings. We also use this map as a, as a template, really, for evaluating uh, proposals that come to the board, whether they're for new transmission lines or anything that might affect Pima County's landscape. We have a sense of how it affects the whole thing. So, you know, and it's not that, that obviously we say, you know, you can't build something, but it's how you build, um, what you can do to minimize the fragmentation, how do you, and, and how are you going to maintain the permeability for the wildlife in these areas. So it, it gives us a tool that we can use uh, for, for the very <laughs> varied and sundry proposals that come before Pima County. Uh, and it gives uh, a communication uh, tool, too, with other land managing agencies. So 
Um, because the other land managing agencies were involved in developing this, they know about it. Uh, the state land department knows about it. We have fruitful conversations with you know, various land managing agencies about how are we going to work towards this now. And in the cultural resources world, um, the same kind of thing happened. The, the map that you saw, um, as well as a list of 229 what we call priority cultural resource sites and areas, uh, was also included in the comprehensive land use plan. And the, the policies that go with that basically are to uh, try to achieve preservation of those sites and places uh, before we'll consider development. So uh, again, a priority on the most important places as was determined. Uh, and this is a, uh, a living document, of course, as was determined at that time by the Cultural Resources Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, the ranch conservation lands uh, that came out of the technical advisory team for uh, ranching is basically the green that you see on here. Uh, basically, these are all active working ranches. Um, there are um, roughly 100 or so. Some ranches have now been consolidated into larger ranches with the drought to give ranchers more options for grazing and resting other pastures. But the, the ranching um, community basically wanted their way of life preserved, and we said we would try to seek ways to ensure that would happen. Uh, another accomplishment of that was the 2004 bond election, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Basically, um, the community uh, supported our role in um, acquiring certain lands and certain sites and places for preservation, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> okay, so um, the, the map that I showed you, the, the conservation land system map, um, was, was too, too broad. I mean, it's, it's great for evaluating uh, proposals on the landscape, but it doesn't really give us the, the roadmap for the 2004 bond election. And so to support that effort, there was a great deal of biological priority setting. And um, that, those involved uh, a lot of experts, uh, expert opinion. Uh, it involved the Nature Conservancy and Arizona Land, Open Land Trust um, helped to develop a very explicit map about which lands are highest priority for future acquisition uh, for biological purposes. And that way everybody knew, um, had some idea whether, you know, are you talking about our land or not? And if so, you know, is this a likely to happen or not likely to happen? But, it, but everybody knew going into the bond election, uh, because of this priority setting effort on the biological side, what would occur. Um, now obviously the slate of lands that was identified was broader than what one bond election uh, can cover. And actually uh, we have a, a, one of the citizens who's advised uh, Pima County, there was a citizens committee set up to advise uh, Pima County about the, the selection of any particular land. This was gonna be through willing seller acquisitions mm -hmm. and not through condemnation. And so as people came forward, there would need to be some kind of vetting process. So vetting against the map of priorities, uh, but also you know, an understanding of the particular characteristics um, that any parcel might offer. So um, a citizen committee advises Pima County about those acquisitions. Um, right. That's the Conservation Acquisition Commission. So after the 2004 bond election um, was approved to go forward, the, and these priorities were set, the Conservation Acquisition Commission basically uh, advised the board, as Julia said, and uh, as to what came forward. Um, we, let's see, we want to talk about the um, prior, the science. You want to talk? Um, you know, in, in the interest of time. Yeah, to maybe not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, basically, I think we've covered it, just that the technical advisory teams basically inform decisions that were made about setting priorities. And the importance of that is there was, had been a firewall between the science, whether it's cultural resources science, biological science, and the political world. 
and there was not that there was not the influence of political influence of saying buy this parcel in my district mm. we didn't that was the firewall that wasn't going to happen it was all science based and it gave a really good firm uh, basis and, and rationale to move forward with uh, recommendations that th came through the Conservation Acquisition Commission to the board. And it also, I think, gave voters confidence that this wasn't um, just a political favor, that in fact, these lands were valuable for going forward. So with the 2004 bond, and I'll just quickly go through this, uh, $174 million was approved for open space acquisitions in 2004. And those included open space, a lot of the habitat areas that, the, that are, are uh, shown on the conservation land system and as well, but they were largely on ranch lands. Um, community open space, and these are areas within the, each jurisdiction, Marana, Saurita, City of Tucson, that was important to that jurisdiction for conservation purposes. Um, and then there was the um, Davis Monthan, basically setting aside areas around Davis Monthan to uh, ensure open space, but also have some um, safe areas there. Uh, there were also a few urban open space parcels that the, the city pr pr principally identified. There was also $20 million identified for cultural resource site preservation that included acquisition as also rehab, uh, rehabilitation of existing historic uh, properties. Um, we were able to acquire them, again, all willing sellers. Uh, we were able to acquire easements. And when we applied funds to another jurisdiction, we made sure we had an intergovernmental agreement with that jurisdiction that um, that we held a, a property right to that, that they couldn't uh, then either sell it or somehow dispose of it that would uh, negate the investment that the voters had made in preserving that historic property. And the handout, which is really the PowerPoint that uh, you have at your tables, identifies every one of those projects that was um, served by the vote uh, in 2004. Um, and then, uh, let's see. I want to mention, too, that oh. um, the, the 2004 bond election acquisitions, really, the ones that actually were acquired, are described at length in this document, which is on the Pima County, Pima.gov website. Um, it's, it's very you know, thoroughly illustrated, and it's got lots of maps about where the properties are, how much we spent on each one. Um, you know, there was a massive bond audit recently. We came through with flying colors about the administration of this program, and actually it was recommended that other jurisdictions develop a similar process for, for not just open space bonds, but mm -hmm. a lot of other types. Yeah. And then uh, I'd just like to have Julia talk briefly about the MSCP. Sure. So, um, you know, we've acquired all these lands, and we are managing now uh, ranches in cooperation with ranchers. We are managing 200,000 acres of, of ranches, and this has a, a, a great value in terms of, you know, directing future growth and protecting watersheds, as well as conserving species. And so um, the, the Endangered Species Act, you know, it's funny, we started on this road of um, getting what's called a Section 10 permit under the Endangered Species Act. And that's a, that's a voluntary action. Uh, no, the Fish and Wildlife Service can't compel us to get this special permit. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to measure up. And instead of saying uh, we have a plan and then struggling for a decade like many other communities have to implement the plan, what we've done is we've said we've developed the plan and we've largely implemented the plan. And we're only now going back to Fish and Wildlife Service and say, um, recognize what we've done, what we've accomplished over the last 10 years by granting us this permit. And so the funding, you know, uh, for a lot of the program elements in terms of regulations, you know, uh, with this process, we tweaked our regulations to, to meet the standard of Fish and Wildlife Service. We've acquired through your support and, and others of the bond election, we've supplied a lot of the mitigation lands for the species. Um, so what we are doing right now is going to Fish and Wildlife Service for this permit. We have just completed a, a, a public comment period on that that ended March 15th, uh, and an environmental impact statement. Um, and the impact statement has to be written because this is a federal action to grant us 
this endangered species permit. And what it will do is it will streamline the process for future development uh, that is consistent with the plan that we've you know, put in place. Uh, this is something that um, everybody's known about in the development community uh, and the environmental community and the ranching community, at least uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the players, uh, for a decade. So it's not that uh, much of a surprise um, to people. Uh, there is still, uh, you know, issues about, you know, what are the details of exactly how this is going to be implemented, and that's what we're working on right now. So um, the handout that um, is uh, one of the, the third one I handed out is describes that program in greater detail. And what it'll do is it'll require us to legally protect all of the lands that we've acquired over the past for the species, uh, and then manage and monitor them. Now we've made it clear to Fish and Wildlife Service that we are not going to manage these lands for the benefit of a single species, which has been done in some other communities like uh, Austin. You know, they set up a preserve for a salamander here, and they set up a preserve for uh, a, a golden cheek warbler there. No, what the community told us is that they want these lands managed for a variety of purposes, including watershed values and ranching and uh, wildlife more generally. So um, we are. Uh, writing this proposal to Fish and Wildlife Service in that manner that's consistent with what the community agreed uh, was something that was feasible. So um, we hope to get that permit in, in spring of 2014. So just to uh, wrap up and then we'll take your questions. Um, now that, as Julia said, now that we have acquired these uh, conservation lands and they're probably over, they're about 200,000 acres between fee lands, archaeological and historic sites, as well as state grazing leases that are under uh, some sort of county uh, management. We have management responsibilities. We're actually um, looking forward to the next step, which is our conservation lands management program. And um, now that uh, 2004 bonds are totally expended at this point, uh, we'll actually be looking at three elements to ensure that we are being good stewards, and that's the ecological monitoring, which will inform uh, the uh, multi-species conservation plan and the Fish and Wildlife Service that we are upholding our permit that they will be granting to us. There is ranch management. While we have contracts or we have uh, agreements with ranchers who are still working the land and also who are the stewards, they're maintaining the, these ranches for us. We need to make sure that they're managing these ranches to, uh, to the highest and best um, abilities for the health of the land. Um, and then there's cultural resources management. Um, we just did a, a very quick uh, review of what archaeological and historic sites are actually on these conservation lands. And there are only, out of the 200,000 acres, we have 55 recorded sites, which is min a very small number but less than 3% of the area has been inventoried. So our charge now is to determine what it is we have so that we know how to manage it. Conservation uh, doesn't only just happen by itself. It takes active management to ensure that the cultural landscape as well as the um, natural landscape is being uh, conserved and preserved uh, and to meet the voters' expectations. And I just want to conclude, uh, there's a, a great saying on your on this one handout uh, that I think sums it up. It says, the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan combines short-term actions to protect and enhance the natural and cultural environment with long-range planning to ensure that our natural and urban environments not only coexist but develop an interdependent relationship where one enhances the other. Implementing this plan will require continuous cooperation between governments, interest groups, and citizens over the next 20 years, and I would say at least the next 20, maybe the next 50 years. So um, that's, that's the big vision. Um, our update to you is uh, sort of a 10-year progress report. Uh, there have been things happening. It's a living document and a living plan that we're continuing to implement. So thank you, and with that, we'll take questions. <laughs> OK. Thanks. I really appreciate uh, your presentation. There are a lot of blanks in my, in my knowledge and information that you filled in. Now, insofar as this is an archaeological cafe, tell us about the archaeological resources specifically 
in the plan and their status. <laughs> All right. Um, again, I'm going to refer you to this handout and the priority cultural resources. Um, we know we have many more sites than the 55 on those ranch lands, so we will be um, trying to apply for grants, uh, requesting funding from the County Board of Supervisors to go forward and inventory those lands where we can try to validate that predictive model that we did um, to ensure their conservation uh, going forward. Um, so that is a future effort. But in the bond election, that again, you have that handout on the table, um, we've acquired, I think, some very um, key properties in the urban area that had been threatened by development. Uh, Los Morteros up in Marana uh, at the north end of the Tucson Mountains, the Valencia site, which is at uh, I-19 in the river. Um, it's zoned industrial by the city, for example, um, and a very critical, important uh, ball court village site. Los, Los Morteros is a ball court village site as well. We acquired the west half of Tumamoc Hill, uh, which was owned by the Arizona State <laughs> Land Department and uh, had been zoned for 500 to 700 houses. Um, we acquired uh, Dakota Wash, which is part of the West Branch community. Um, the, West, the Dakota Wash site is, um, represents uh, some very early uh, settlement, and then it was abandoned. Uh, the settlement dispersed over the West Branch and then came back to, uh, in later in Tanka Verde phase, to the Dakota Wash site. Um, it too had been uh, planned for development um, and, uh, and then subsequently uh, the developer came to the county. We own the Reeve Ruin out on the San Pedro River. Uh, it's part of the A7 Ranch, but it was a, uh, it's an important um, Pueblo ruin, if you will, uh, that was excavated some years ago. We purchased the Coyote Mountains uh, Archaeological Complex. Uh, it's also called Old Hayhook Ranch on some of the maps, and it's at the base of uh, Kitt Peak. Um, there's an, an incredible array of um, platform mound uh, village sites out there uh, surrounding a spring uh, that um, had been developed by a, uh, into a, a kind of watering place for cattle, but there are rock shelters in there. Um, it's an incredible landscape um, that we were able to preserve, and that's 834 acres. Um, we also acquired for preservation Steam Pump Ranch. Oro Valley actually owns that, and we're working with them to um, restore it and, and develop it into a, uh, a heritage site for their uh, community. We acquired the last part of the Adkins Steel uh, parcel, uh, which is the last part of the old Fort Lowell that was not in public ownership. We're working on that currently. We're about to uh, issue a a contract to restore the officers' quarters and um, make that a, a site that the public can visit. We acquired the Pantano town site uh, out on uh, Cienega Creek. So there are a number of sites we've acquired, to answer your question. Um, there are many more that we own that we simply haven't fully inventoried. I can't give you a full, you know, a number of what those are at this point. Uh, but certain other areas like Cienega Creek, there have been graduate student surveys in some of these areas. So we have an abundance of data. We have those on a GIS system. We know when there's going to be a management action taken. If we don't have an inventory of an area, we make sure the, um, the area is surveyed or inventoried to ensure there's no disturbance, let's just say, from a water line uh, to a ranch house. Uh, we are, you know, we are, ins we are taking actions to ensure we inventory that property before there's any um, disturbance to it. Uh, our goal over the, in the conservation land management program going forward is to increase that inventory. Good presentation, thank you. Okay. To uh, let us know better how this system works, uh, either take a situation that you've worked through and tell us what the big steps were, or fabricate one, make one up, that would, il <laughs> that would illustrate the process. In terms of our uh, inventory, which process? Well, the cultural whatever, resources process? Yeah, the, the permitting process, for example. 
Oh, um, land use? You, you oh. mean in terms of the multi-species conservation plan, the endangered species uh, well, you, you, component of it? You pick the, you pick the ones okay. that are either most interesting or most difficult. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, well, I mean, the cultural resources side of this is um, just what I started to say. I mean, we follow a federal model of uh, inventory, evaluation, impact assessment, and mitigation. Okay, those steps. Um, if we and we do this regardless of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, the Pima County's always had policies to protect cultural resources that we have some authority over, whether it's building permits, rezonings county roads, county parks, every bit of land that is affected in some way by a capital improvement project or a public works project or a private sector development comes through our team to do uh, just what I said, that inventory, assessment, impact evaluation, and mitigation. And um, if it's a rezoning, I'll just use that as a, as a case. Um, this is in Pima County, unincorporated Pima County. Someone comes in with a rezoning. They want to take um, what's called RH or rural homestead zoning, which is one house per four acres. They want to upzone it to commercial. So they, they make an application through our development services uh, department. Development services uh, comes to us with their rezoning proposal. We review it. We say, ah, you've got sites on that property. Um, we write a staff report, it goes back into the rezoning um, uh, documentation, it goes to the Board of Supervisors. Board of Supervisors, assume, uh, we're just gonna assume they approve this, this upzoning or this increase in density or intensification of use. There is a condition on that zoning that says you must complete the archeological data recovery mitigation project, or you need to preserve it in place. Sometimes we can achieve it, but mostly we cannot if it's a private sector development. We say, okay, we work with that consultant. It's his nickel to go out and get the cultural resources work done, mitigation work done. Um, there are agreements with the Arizona State Museum. They have to have burial agreements in place. That all comes back to our office for review in terms of a plan of work or a mitigation plan. We approve it. Sometimes if it has to go to the state, the State Historic Preservation Office is also weighs in on it. And then we give them the go-ahead to proceed with that mitigation action. Only until that is done uh, and all the conditions, curation of artifacts, the report, until, until that is done, um, they are not relieved of that condition. So uh, it is only after they've finished all the field work that we will give them a conditional uh, go ahead on a project. Um, so that's how we would handle a, a rezoning uh, for a cultural resources property. If it was a capital project, like a road that the county, we work, we work with the Department of Transportation engineers to um, like do the same process, inventory, and we will contract for that. We don't go out in the field ourselves, there's just simply too much work to do. We contract for those services, we get a consultant report back, and this is for a county project. That project pays for it, so I don't have a budget. We just depend on uh, the capital project budget to have a line item in it for this work. We, again, assess it. Uh, it. Are there impacts? No, the project goes ahead. If there are impacts, then that department pays for the cultural resources work. If we can avoid it, that's always our top priority. We take, try, definitely take a preservation approach whenever possible, but it's not always possible. Okay, next question is over here, and we're in the feedback zone, so I'm gonna try to stand behind you, in between you and the microphone. Uh, you spoke of the uh, endangered species permit. What does this permit you to do that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do? Mm -hmm. okay. So the question is about um, what the Endangered Species Act permit uh, allows you to do that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So um, the Endangered Species Act says that you cannot hurt, harm, or harass a, a listed species, a federally listed species, um, unless you're a federal agency and you go through something called a Section 7 consultation. And so this applies to uh, projects that have some kind of federal nexus, um, whether it's federal funding or federal um, uh, permits required. Um, and if you go through a, a Section 7 consultation, then you can be allowed to do certain things, but you have to mitigate, you have to avoid and minimize 
obviously, as much as you can, and then mitigate any unrelated actions. And there's a very strict procedure for how that's done. The private sector, including Pima County, as a, as a builder, we build a lot of uh, infrastructure for future development, right? Future growth of the city, and we maintain infrastructure as well that might intersect with the habitat of endangered species. Um, there's no similar process if you don't have a federal nexus. And so for many years, um, since the endangered species inception, the federal agencies always had this no but, you know, clause. But, this, but the, the private sector, including local government, did not unless there was some kind of, you know, federal permit involved. So uh, Congress uh, finally in the, the, the late 80s um, amended the uh, Endangered Species Act to allow for uh, what they called incidental take. Incidental take is um, hurt, harming, harassing that might occur during otherwise, lawfully act, otherwise lawful activities. So it doesn't allow you to go and club the baby heart seal or uh, rip the owl out of the nest, but if you are doing a project that might incidentally affect a species, then there's a way, a process, a similar process to Section 7 that's afforded uh, either a local community, such as Pima County, or an individual developer. And so uh, a number of communities in the United States have entered into this, this agreement. Basically, it's a, it's a voluntary agreement between the community and the Fish and Wildlife Service that meets certain standards that are similar to, to the Section 7 standards. And uh, they take a long time, so they're seldom done. Uh, but uh, we do have, you know, uh, similar plans in place in uh, Las Vegas, Austin, uh, Riverside County, uh, a number of places in Southern California, also Texas. And so these were kind of the models for us to look at as to like, mm, do we really want to go down that process? Uh, you know, it takes 10 years, it is, uh, can be very costly, what are the pitfalls? So we've tried to learn from the experience of other communities who have developed similar agreements with the federal government. Did, did that answer your question? So it allows you to, to, to do a project uh, that you might otherwise have to wait until uh, the, the owl flies away. Um, you might have to wait until you have a federal nexus and you can get the federal agency to do the process for you. Um, generally, it doesn't these things generally don't stop a project. And it also, the, one of the attractive features of the Section 10 permit that, that communities like us can, can pursue is that you can deal with um, issues of uh, species that may be listed in the future. And the attractiveness from Fish and Wildlife Service's standpoint is the other process, you, if you do it project by project, you have a roadway project, you're building a road, there's only so much you can do within the prism of the road to mitigate that project. And so if you can take a more comprehensive approach that looks at the whole landscape, uh, then you can start to address some of the real species endangerment issues on a landscape level basis. And so this is why environmentalists and fish and wildlife are interested in this, in this permit that allows harm to species. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a benefit for the species. There's got to be a net benefit. And the net benefit here is to address some of the causes of endangerment in a way that cannot be done by approaching it on a on a project by project basis. To further answer your question, um, these are the lands we've acquired with the okay. 2004 bonds. That's our mitigation bank. It's our land bank, OK? Um, it is on those lands where we are preserving habitat so the Section 10 permit allows us to allow impacts to occur somewhere else, let's just say over here, that might affect habitat. Let's say it's a Pima pineapple cactus, or um, uh, let's just use that as an example. Um, but we're going to conserve over here, for every one acre impacted here, we're going to conserve five acres over here. So we actually have a, a multiplier. This is our land bank, so we're assuming a certain level of impact of, from growth and development, both county projects and the private sector. And we will cover those under, it's just like an insurance policy, think of it that way. We've assembled the bank. You're going to impact one acre here, we're going to preserve five acres over here. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has said, 
that's great because you're preserving and you're putting under a, a permanent conservation easement those lands that will offset those impacts to that species in that one particular place. So as we, uh, while we've purchased this land, we don't have permanent easements on those. We're going to place easements on ourselves so that these lands can't be sold going in the future. So that it's in perpetuity that um, those, it, that acreage, that kind of habitat will be preserved for the benefit of the longevity of that species, the survival of that species. So we're extending that Section 10 permit as an insurance policy to the county's actions and the development community, their private actions. This is how we were able to convince all the stakeholders at the end of the day, the, that negotiated process, that this Section 10 ben, uh, permit will benefit all their interests, if that helps answer your question. Uh, to what extent would you say you've been hindered or helped by the federal and state governments? Well, I would say we had quite a bit of help uh, from the federal government. Um, so we had uh, $3 million in, in funding to, to do the, the biological inventories, uh, to do the public process, um, to reach out to the community in 600 public meetings uh, with conversations, uh, you know, getting people together at the Desert Museum and having, you know, some, in some cases, you know, some pretty high-level people come out and who are subject matter experts on various topics that were of interest to the community to get some consensus on some of these topics, um, to, to record the input from the public comment period, to do the environmental impact statement on the proposal. So mm -hmm. we've had a lot of help from the federal government. Right. And to help, you know, help prepare some of the more than 200 reports that we uh, produced. And um, I think, you know, the Endangered Species Act exists. Um, the federal government, the agency we're working with, has been very uh, cooperative, helpful in finding a solution. And we actually found a solution that's unique, and I think that they're uh, appreciating all our efforts because it o opens up a new process for them, basically, that they hadn't considered. Because we have so much land in the West, in particular, that we don't have to create a park for a species. Mm -hmm. We can create a landscape. And through mitigation or land banking that we're doing, and that, you know, hopefully there'll be additional bond elections to uh, consolidate more of this, these properties, you know, we're taking a landscape level approach, which is a very different approach than the, the service has taken. Mm -hmm. and, but they've welcomed that. Uh, approach. Uh, state land department we're working with, uh, we hold grazing leases. Um, they have been very cooperative and hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. in the future perhaps we can purchase that land from the, from the state land department for conservation purposes. So I would say that the laws exist. Uh, we found creative ways with the agencies to deal with them. What about the state? The, the state land department has been working with us on the ranch conservation element, which involves holding grazing leases. Um, mm -hmm. So that has worked out well. Um, they have put to auction uh, lands that have been identified as high priorities for cultural resources, mm -hmm. including the Tumumak Hill site. Valencia site. Um, and Valencia site. And we've just acquired another uh, tract of land from the state land department uh, in the Tortolita area that adds another over 1,000 acres uh, to the Tortolita Mountain Park. Um, so they've been, they've been helpful where they can. They have, um, you know, certain restrictions as far as what they can do that come from the state constitution, and they have to stick to those. So, um, but they're making the edges match where they can. They, and the agencies are understanding that open space conservation increases the value of adjacent suburban and urban lands. So there is a, you know, they see the benefit in terms of value back to them as well. From what about the state? Uh, you want to talk about the wildlife corridors? Yeah, so um, one of the outcomes of, of this was uh, an allocation of uh, $45 million for uh, wildlife connections under uh, roadways. And so uh, some of that money, a little bit of it has gone into some studies to support the, you know, where is the best place to put those structures. And uh, there are a number of uh, plans being developed to construct uh, wildlife uh, crossings underneath Oracle Highway 
uh, Interstate 10, Ajo Highway, there's been a number of um, uh, places identified and target species because depending on what kind of species you're, you're talking about, the crossing needs to be configured in a way that fits with those species needs. So um, ADOT's involved and they've actually taken a, a huge uh, proactive step in the whole state by prioritizing wildlife linkages. So these are broader geographic areas um, where they feel like the connectivity and the experts advising them, the connectivity for wildlife movement is impaired and is a high priority for, for repairing. And so at a statewide level, our plan dovetails with that very well. Okay, I think the next question was up here. The first thing when I heard you say the last bond was 2004, mm -hmm. and then I thought, wait, we're in 2013. That's a long way to wait to get a lot of money to help you do what you're doing. So when will another bond issue happen? <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you for your question. Um, the economy, of course, is the problem. And um, the community, uh, for the community to support a bond, I think there needs to be confidence that things are improving for them. Um, and because uh, while I think the county administrator and the board have been very good about keeping uh, the tax rate b level, um, that is still the goal. And so because properties have devalued over the last eight years or so, six years, um, we may or may not be ready yet. So the soonest, and it depends on what that capacity will be and also how the economy proceeds, the soonest bond election could be November of 14, 2014, but it may not, it may be a, a very limited scope. Uh, we don't know yet. And there's a citizens bond advisory committee and they meet, um, I think the next meeting is in May. Um, there are public meetings as well. It's a large group of um, uh, citizens who have been on this committee uh, for many years at this point. And they are deliberating exactly that question that you ask. and and which which projects should mm -hmm. come forward which are which are the highest priority projects that should come forward open space is on the list but whether it's funded to the level of um you know that's been suggested <coughs> is another question over here are you interested in small parcels of land such as 60 acres behind us, which is zoned suburban ranch, and a builder got in there a couple of years ago, but fortunately had to pull out because of the collapse. But, uh, you know, the neighbors were very happy because of that. <laughs> but uh, it's in the vicinity of Overton and La Cunada, and it's horse property all around it. Uh -huh. it we, there is a mechanism for property owners um, uh, to come forward uh, as a willing seller. Well, this to, is in somebody's estate, which has made it very difficult, and whoever owns it is yeah. not even in Tucson, so. Yeah, well, like I said, it would have to be a willing seller because we will not condemn property. And, and if they come forward, uh, there's an application process, and then it'll be taken to the Citizens Advisory Committee. Staff will do a report on it. Is this, does this fit our priorities that we've established? And then if it does, it'll go to the Citizens Committee so for a review. On the internet and it can be reached. Yeah, we can give you a website and uh, okay. yeah. And I wanna say too that um, we've had a number of significant donations as well. And um, you know, so it just depends. Size isn't so much an issue. It's uh, kind of where the property is located in, in terms of its manageability. Is it part of, you know, right next to some lands we already manage? How does it fit in terms of the, the cultural resource priorities, the biological resource priorities? So I wouldn't say the acreage size is important, but location, location, location uh, is important. Yeah. yeah. And, and donations, you know, we're, we've had thousands of acres and millions of dollars worth of acres already donated that fit into the big picture of creating yeah. this uh, permeable landscape or maintaining this permeable landscape for wildlife and protecting cultural resources and keeping ranchers ranchers. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. It's very synergistic, so I, that, you know, we couldn't, one of us couldn't just give this talk, so really I appreciate all of you coming and hearing us all because it, you know, preserving landscape level uh, lands 
uh, preserves cultural resources and the biological uh, resources we're all trying to protect. And so uh, it really works together. And they tend to overlap, too, I must say. So uh, those same lands are of importance to um, a variety of interests, conservation interests. OK, next question over here. In uh, the development of habitat conservation plan and doing your section 10 consultation, did you, uh, as an outcome, uh, recommend zoning changes and other development regulations, such as uh, buffers or other land use restrictions? So the, the question pertained to uh, um, changing regulations in terms of the habitat conservation plan. The answer is yes. Um, Early on, there were deficiencies uh, noted. I mean, we have a, a lot of, of good environmental ordinances that have been developed over the years. And so part of the work of the science team and staff was basically to review those ordinances. What do they contribute for species protection? And where are the gaps? And so early on, one of the gaps that was uh, identified was about where our riparian areas are and uh, what, are, what is their significance. And we had a riparian map, and we had a, a, an ordinance that did uh, start to address that, but it wasn't good enough. And so part of that planning grant that we got from the federal government went into uh, very comprehensive mapping of all of the riparian habitats, including the stream site habitats that are associated with, with ephemeral streams, and classification of those according to scientific uh, procedures. And then prioritization and looking at how they overlap with other resources, including species habitats. So um, the result of that, and, and this took, you know, took a year to develop the maps, and it took two years to uh, go through a public process um, that involved the private sector and environmentalists and many other people who were interested in how to amend the ordinance to meet that new standard and uh, also, you know, meet the feasibility in terms of, you know, having community acceptance, you know, how much regulation, how little regulation. So um, that's just one example. We went through uh, an environmentally road, uh, sensitive roadway design was another one um, that came out of the need to protect the pygmy owl habitat better. So there were a number of uh, procedural tweaks that were put in place incrementally over the last 10 years. Hey, we have time for one last question tonight, so here we go. Thank you. Uh, two related questions. Um, <laughs> well, they're related. Um, short of buying something or having, don having land donated to you, is there any way you can say no uh, to uh, development if it's consistent with uh, the general plan or something of that nature? And second, um, is there a, an estimate of the uh, uh, maximum build-out population that, that's within the area of the uh, conservation plan. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. You want to go first? Or <laughs> <do I? laughs> go ahead, Julia. All right. Well, um, in terms of rezonings, yes, the Board of Supervisors can say no. Yes, they have said no. It hasn't occurred very often, uh, but it, 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 it has, and most notably in the case of uh, the Kanoa Ranch, which was mm -hmm. part of why we uh, got the Kanoa Ranch, was because of the, the Board saying no to the proposal. Um, no. If, it, if you are developing at the zoning that you already have, uh, then, you're, then you're considered entitled. So that means you, you can develop under your existing zoning, but not if you're coming forward and you want a rezoning, which is, is generally the case mm -hmm. in these big master plan communities. The, the zoning that, that is typically on these, these areas of ranch land is generally going to be um, rural homestead. Mm -hmm. uh, RH or um, in some cases uh, GR. GR, yeah, GR1 zoning. So very low density. Um, so to, to, to take some of these ranch lands and, you know, turn those into master plan community, you're generally going to be going through a, a rezoning process. And so, you know, I call that kind of a public giving in a way. So there's a giving of high increased land use intensities and a promise of, you know, some urban infrastructure to support that. Uh, and in response, you can have a negotiated outcome. You know, it can be yes, it can be no, it can be yes, but, you know. Um, so that was the first part of your question. Now, um, the second part, remind me. Uh, is there an estimate of the population. Uh, build-out population? Ah, yes, the building population. So 
one of the, at the time of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, um, people were obviously concerned about water resources. Was water a limiting factor? And the estimates that we had at that time were 1.8 million people could be supported by the water uh, resources that are currently available. However, if you ratchet down water consumption, if you um, do a lot of reuse of our effluent that is currently supporting the Santa Cruz River wetlands, if you do a lot of things to uh, maximize your CAP uh, storage very quickly, uh, if you devote the, the necessary millions of dollars to, to get the infrastructure that you need to do as much as you can with the water resources you have, then it could be something like 2.3 million. And if you do even more of the same, mm -hmm. uh, you could probably squeeze out some, some more capacity to support uh, population. So uh, those are the numbers that have been we've been working with at that time and we're kind of a framework for, you know, like, okay, so let's, let's just say, you know, water's the limiting factor. I mean, how, how would you allocate the land to it? Do you really need all of Eastern Pima County to support, you know, the, the, the number of population that you could max out on? And densification is another response to that, that, you know, maintaining a more compact urban core and retaining our ranch lands you know, forces the population into an area where services already exist and it's less costly to the taxpayers and to the county and to the cities to actually provide services in a more limited geographic area. So there is another kind of, um, uh, you know, part of that equation that needs to be considered. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you. Fascinating.